We are live. Welcome to episode two of the D and E podcast. Siblings talking to each other because they're siblings. And this week we are going to be talking about two things that we like. They're 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 they're, they're these things behind me. You see on on my wall, right? Yes, books. Emma actually has both of them there. This one's your copy. You left it, and I took it. You've got the last one. You got the first one. I have the last one. Hey! hey. Look at him. Look at him. He is cool. He Ooh. knows what he's talking about. This version of him has four arms, so he's even cooler. Oh, I upgraded. <laughs> Look, you've got, you got cloud temples, and it's a, it's a weird-ass cool. series. We don't have any of that in this book, but we'll get there. <laughs> no, sure. We're going to be talking about two <laughs> book series that we both adore uh, greatly. I'll be talking about... Dan Simmons, the Hyperion Cantos, and Emma will be telling me all about, I don't know the author's name, but the mysterious- Fenton Lee Stewart's The Mysterious Benedict Society. Yes, all right. Fenton so, Lee Stewart, it's Trenton backwards, Lee but still. Fenton Lee Stewart, the, 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 that's the kind of name you can only say whilst like hoisting a, a mug of tea to your lips. With Fenton your Lee Stewart. <laughs> Fenton Lee Stewart, oh yes, The Mysterious Benedict Society. I do say original. That literally could not be farther from the actual vibe of the book, which is just great. Okay, cool. Nice. <laughs> this, this is great. This is cool. All right. So anyway, so Emma, start us off again. Tell us okay. a little bit about what what is so mysterious about the society of eggs. <laughs> okay. First of all, the first book is called The Mysterious Benedict Society. The second book is called The Mysterious Benedict Society and the Perilous Journey. The third book is called The Mysterious Benedict Society and the Prisoner's Dilemma. The prequel is called The Extraordinary Education of Nicholas Benedict and a completely unrelated book but written by the same author, equally as good and everybody should also read, is The Secret Keepers. Okay. Throwing that out there, throwing that out there. We'll get to The Secret Keepers on a different time. But so the prequel came out after all three of the books came out, and uh, I'll lay out the, the actual plot so it'll make sense. The Mysterious Benedict Society, which my copy is incredibly well-worn, the front cover is basically falling off. I had to tape it, and like five, just like all over the place. The only other series of, like, author that you talked to me about the most when we were growing up was uh, yeah. Probably Lemony Snicket. Yeah. So Handler. And I was, I didn't even reread, you know, Lemony Snicket's stuff as nearly as much as I have, you know, Trenton. My man Trent. My I'm going to call boy, my man Trent. My boy T.L.S. My boy Trent. Um, anyways, so the plot is, it follows this boy named Renard Muldoon, Renny for short. I am and, hooked, okay. Yeah, right? Great name. Yeah. Um, so he, he's this precocious young child who lives in an orphanage and he's got this tutor because he's so smart that he's like basically blown all the teachers away. So he has this tutor, um, and she's teaching him Tamil. Um, and you know, they read this newspaper ad saying, are you a gifted young child looking for special opportunities? And it's like a, it's like a test. So he goes to the test and there's this really long line of kids and he's like, oh my God, all these kids are probably so much smarter than I am. I have no idea. And the test is like this rigorous thing. Uh, you know, there's various weird questions like if two train, trains are on the same track and they're going at each other at this speed, at what point in the track will they meet? Stuff like that, but also mixed with- Stuff like, stuff like what tastes better? Ego buttermilk or ego home style and you're just exactly like like, like there's this there's this oh my gosh. there's this question that features a picture of a chessboard and the black pawn there's a black the only piece that's moved is a black pawn that's two spaces out. Yeah. And the question is, is this a legal chess move? And so it kind of trips you up. It's like, well, no, because out of racism, white always goes first. Yeah. But it is legal because what if the white knight went out and then the black pawn went forward and then the white knight went back? So, you know, there's like, it's a really like simple thing, but as he's going through these tests, he is like the only one who's passing all the tests. Mm -hmm. Everybody, like these are, this is the name of children who may return for the second round of testing. And everybody's like second round of testing. And it's like Bernard Muldoon. That is all. And it's like, what? Only one kid. Are you kidding me? And so like, you know, then he goes to the next round of testing, and there's only one other guy there, and his name is Sticky. He calls, he calls himself Sticky. 
He's bald. He's brown. His name is Sticky. And he calls himself that because everything he reads sticks in his head. He's totally, he's got a total and complete, like, Gave what's it called? A superhero name. I love he it. He did. He did. What's it called when you're, um, like a photographic memory? Oh, yeah. Iodetic memory. An iodetic memory. Um, yeah. And then they meet this other girl named Kate Weatherall, who is, like, super tall, super blonde, carries around a fire engine red bucket on her belt loop like it's a regular size bucket and it's full of stuff and she's got so much energy and sticky's over here like fiddling constantly cleaning his glasses and rennie's just kind of vibing and like kate's like ha was that too loud um like she runs into the room and the guys are like what's going on and she's like nothing i just don't like walking it's too slow and they're like why did you run and she's like it's faster <laughs> and then they eventually meet this little girl named constance who's probably three feet tall. She wears this red coat, like a puffy red coat, and she's so obstinate. She's so incredibly, like, rude, no, and I, no, she, yeah, I, exactly, exactly. She, she's what are you talking about. She's really difficult, but she's also not, like, out of her way rude. It's like, you know, she just kind of, like, she's rude. Yeah, she's just kind of, like, difficult and stubborn and stuff, right? So, like, passive aggressively, like, too much for everybody. Yeah. So, there's all these, like, mind games that they go through, and you kind of are, like, being tested while they're being tested, and you're like, oh, interesting. Ooh. And so, they, um, they get through the, all the courses, all of the testing and stuff, and they, you know, at the very end of the day, they're introduced to this man who is tall. He wears a green plaid suit. He has rumpled white hair, a big cucumber red, like they always describe his nose as similar to a vegetable um, nose. And <laughs> okay. Um, and he's just really happy. He's really lovely. He's like a neat guy. And he's like, hi, my name is Nicholas Benedict. And I have been conducting this test for a really long time. And I'm gonna tell you all this information. This guy named Ladrop the Curtain. <laughs> That's literally the bad guy's name is Ladrop the Curtain. <laughs> There's great puns. There's literally in in uh wow. in this book, there's a country named Theron Back Again. What when I finish the, Get the, it! When, like Lord of the Rings. when I finish the book I'm currently reading, I'm probably not gonna I, I, I'm either going to finish this trilogy or I'm going to read one of these books. I'm telling you, they're so funny. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, so anyways, the bad guy's name is Ladrop the Curtain. Okay. And But they don't know that that's his name. All they know is that he's the sender. Mm. He's the sender because he sends these subliminal hidden messages through the news into everybody's minds. Ooh, okay. And so they, like Mr. Benedict and his assistants, who were all children who passed the tests previously, yeah. but grew up, like he needs children for this task because he needs to send them to this like boarding school, it's called the Institute, that La Drop the Curtain runs. Okay, yeah. Um, and they need to find out, and they need to destroy, basically, this machine that he's sending out these messages on because these are the messages that are like uh the free market will always be free if there is somebody controlling it the free market is free once it is free enough to you know delve within its own freedom uh, right it's like really crazy shit like um Instagram business bro that's horrible mm -hmm. and it's like there's literally even a thing where they talk about poison apples poison worms like mm. Mm. but that's like so they encourage students to keep their TVs on all the time because the messages come through the TV and through the news and stuff. So oh. like, um, and that's one of the reasons why those kids have never liked watching the news. And they're like, oh, other kids don't get that weird, creepy feeling we get when we watch the news. It's because we're intelligent enough and sensitive enough to register this like fucked up signal that we couldn't translate, but we could register it. And that's why there's this quote emergency been going on. Everybody's been talking about like, oh, um, the state of the world is in disarray and blah, blah, blah. It's because this guy's been manipulating subtly and subliminally everybody all along these years, like, hello, 
I will come out of nowhere and save the day. I will, I will abolish the emergency. I will fix everything. And he's got these plans to be called the master of all Earth's regions, like literally master. Mm. Anywho. Um, so the kids have to stop him. And then they stop him in the first book. And in the second book, he kind of comes back. And then they have to stop him again. And then the third book, he kind of comes back. And then they stop him for real. But the reason that Nicholas Benedict can't, yeah, the reason that Nicholas Benedict can't do this himself is because he has narcolepsy. Oh my God, yes. But he has narcolepsy in a way that like when he experiences like intense emotion, that's when he falls asleep. So like when he laughs really hard, like then you come to find out that Constance, the most stubborn one, the reason why she's so short is because she's not even three years old. She's that, got- Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And at the end of the third book, she cures Nicholas Benedict of his narcolepsy. Oh, okay. She looks into his eyes and changes his brain. And she's doing that all through the third book. She's finding these ways to manipulate people. Like she looks sticky in the eyes and convinces him that he doesn't want his pie anymore. And then she starts eating the pie or she starts eating his ice cream or something. And she's like, oh my God, I feel so sick. Like manipulating somebody to her advantage has an instant ramification on her body. It's a crazy fucking series, man. Also, I haven't even mentioned Kate keeps the most insane fucking shit in her bucket. Have I mentioned? She keeps a coiled rope at the bottom, a really fucking strong horseshoe magnet, a regular flashlight and a pen flashlight, some clear fishing twine, some extra strength glue. Um, Over time, she gets a peregrine falcon, so she keeps little meat strips inside of the bucket. Worst comes to worst, you can always, in the beginning, you can always dump out the bucket and tip it over and stand on it. But as the series goes on, she gets a lid for the bucket. Oh, okay. Um, and she she keeps considering all through the series, like she keeps joking, like, I really do need a paddle. I need a paddle so I can tightrope balance it or something. It's funny. That's like, cool. no matter what she does, she's so fucking acrobatic. Like, and then you find out she ran away from home and joined the circus. And... It makes a lot of sense. Okay. That... Th- Okay, so you know what? Like, just basically keeps going. telling me about this book, it already seems like this guy might have been into the X Men to some degree. <laughs> but, but like, he made the kids normal. Like, they're just so smart. But there's another thing that this reminds me of too. Have you ever read slash seen Umbrella Academy? No. Okay, so you- I know I know about it and stuff. I watched it exist, and Leo told me a lot about it, but I didn't really. Yeah, well, it's it, it's not like superheroes are boring. It's it's pretty cool. If you um, it's by what, uh, it's by one of the artists behind this incredible graphic novel, Day Tripper. Cool. It's just about this guy who like, lives. Like, imagine this like, like depicting like a uh, like like sad emo crazy weird lemony snicket uh, like type. I love that. We love that. It's also written by Gerard Way, which I'm sure they told. Ah! Yeah. That's definitely, yeah. I definitely remember that now. Forgot about that. Yeah. Ah! That's great. A really prolific comic book author at this point, too, yeah. Mm-hmm. He got to the point. That's good. Where, yes, he's, he, he, he's been a secret nerd his whole life. It's wonderful. Um, we love it when that happens. Love it. No, yeah. So, like, like, they're this, but they're this dysfunctional family of, like, uh, of, miraculous children who were born to women who didn't think that they were pregnant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't they, like, wake up one morning all of a sudden and just, like, give birth? Yeah, like, most of them died, and some of them were taken into the custody of this abusive space alien asshole named uh, Professor Hargrave, and they have all these really weird, like, okay, I'll put it this way. If I had to sum them up as, as as a guy who's literally never been outside of the country, Based on how you described it, I would have to describe the Mysterious Benedict Society as feeling very British, and I would have to describe Umbrella Academy as feeling very French. <laughs> oh, what? I, um, I do have to say the Mysterious Benedict Society actually comes off as very American, in my opinion, well, just because people are watching so much TV. That, that's like, a very American thing. For yeah. that reason, I was like, 
But also, it's definitely a made up land, you know, because like these kids are walking around and no police officer is like, where's your adult? Or something, you know. Where's your adult? Here's the adult store. Go buy one. This- <laughs> you don't have enough money? That's why you're in an orphanage. That's why you're in an Seriously. Orphanage. So you can, they have to work to save up money to buy an adult. Her. Her. It's the best line from the, the office is when Andy is like, who did I do this for? I didn't do it for me. I did it for Joe Sixpack. That guy who who wonders how he's going to pay his kids orphanage bills. <laughs> how he's going to fill his car up with oil. That guy shouldn't have to wonder where to park. <laughs> Anyways, tell me tell me about Hyperion now. I will. Your turn. It's your turn. I mean, you could literally just open the book up and okay, wait. No, um, so Hyperion. So- I saw the F word. Yeah, okay, so, so, so. I love it when that happens. You've already seen the cover a lot yes. the past eight years because I've been begging you to read it. So it is the, yes, it's a beautiful cover. It's an incredibly cool. Glorious. So, Quite like a beach. Oh my God, this ship is sailing in, in, in waves of grain. Oh yes, it's really, okay, so. There's mushroom so, trees in the background. And, the Hyperion Cantos, okay, let, let, let's flash back to like the age of the romantic poets. There is this little known poet named John Keats, right? I don't know anything about the history. I know a little bit of, I know a little bit about him. We actually, our, our uncle gave me an old book of Keats poetry because I was Chris. reading this. We love Uncle Chris in this family. We fucking stan Uncle Chris in this we family. Okay. If he's it, a librarian. You can't go wrong. He's a librarian, damn it. I feel like we were, I feel like there is a reference I could make for that, oh, but whatever. So uh, he wrote, these two epic poems. He wrote a one called John Hyper- Keats, not Uncle Chris. John Keats, not a, although <laughs> he, he's, he's probably got to have a couple epics in him by this point, right? I feel like he's probably written some stuff. I, I, I'd be surprised if he hasn't, right? Mayhaps. He wrote two epic poems, the Hyperion Cantos and then a sort of sequel called Endymion, right? Uh, and what, what Dan Simmons, who is a prolific sci-fi slash horror uh, author uh there he actually one of his other novels which is this horror book set in the 1800s uh it, it's about the franklin expedition that got lost up in the far north um mm-hmm. called the terror and it was actually adapted into a series i think it was on amc um starring like half the cast of game of thrones also the other half of the cast of game of thrones um and uh so, Hyper- so this, this book takes place about like five or 600 years in the future, right? Um, there's this web of world, they're actually called the World Web. Um, and they are, uh, um, they're connected by this series of portals called Farcasters, right? Farcasters. Uh, they're a little bit like the, uh, those booths that Louis Wu uses in Ringworld to like hop from planet to planet. Mm-hmm. There are these really cool, um, there, there are these big like singularities in orbit around these worlds. Um, and so, and then they stabilize them into wormholes. And that's what each of these doorways is. You, 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 you are torn apart and then re, re, uh, re, and placed back. Yeah. In. That tends to be the constant with, with portals and stuff. You yeah. are chewed up and spit back out into the proper arrangement. There, there's two different kinds, right? There's kinds where you were reconstituted and then there are kinds where, like, they make two points in space. One, like, yeah, portal, or like, like in, walking through a doorway, or like in um, uh, in the in the Commonwealth books by Peter F. Hamilton. Um, but uh, and there are a bunch of different entities that exist in this universe, right? There's the hegemony of worlds, which doesn't have a president or a king; they have a CEO. Her name is Mina Gladstone. Gladstone, I believe, was one of the advisors in um. Uh, he, uh, he 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 played some role in in, in English uh, government at some point. Um, there's a lot of uh, people who are just they're given names of historical figures in this book. It's a really weird uh, contrast of like whimsical, weird uh, fairy tale logic and like space horror. And then there's hard sci-fi kind of mixed in there. Um, like you've got like these these vessels called torch ships, where they have these like at, like astronomical unit long like trails of fire that mm-hmm. like, shoot behind them and then you've got like you have like spaceships and stuff most people don't use them they just use these far portals 
Um, well, there's there's this one world in the in what's called the outback, like around like the um, like the border of like of colonized space and then uh, other places, right? Called Ugh, colonized space. What a horrible idea. It, you're, you're Jesus. Sp- that's actually one of the themes of the book. So hear me out, right? Yay! Decolonization! So there's this, um, there's this role called Hyperion, and it's this really strange place. So Hyper- Hyperion is the name of the world. It's the name of the world, yes. Gotcha. Not like a person. Like, well, <laughs> name of the bird. Well, I mean, they, they reference John Keats a lot throughout this book. It's a really weird, like, it's both like a loving tribute to him, but also it's this really cool, like, tapestry of themes, right? Mm-hmm. Well, the weirdest thing about Hyperion, there's a couple weird things. The first is this guy. This is the Shrike, right? Mm-hmm. Now, it's actually named after a real bird that exists in real life. The, now, the Shrike. So the Shrike is this bird who impales its prey on, like, spikes. Which <gasps> are and that's what this guy does, right? He's this weird thing. No one knows where it came from, what it does, if it even has a name. Aside, They just call it the Shrike because... Mm-hmm. It's legendary because legendarily, it it when it it, uh, it can abduct people. This is the Shrike. This is the Shrike. Look at that little boy. He he says hello. Hi. To every to everybody. And especially to Dan Simmons for giving. Also, the Shrike is just a dank ass name. Honestly, especially since Hosier made the song, I I'm gonna have the Shrike stuck in my head for the rest of the day. Thank you, by the way. I need to listen to that album by the way very good do I have to very good so so that that's the first weird thing about this right there, there's also these really cool uh, trees that shoot lightning they're called Tesla trees oh yeah actually if you flip Hyperion back uh, to the back cover you can probably see them actually where <laughs> are you lost in your own I was like I don't know where they went. <laughs> okay. are they the little mushroomy trees yeah I think those guys um, and there's this strange race of people there called the Bakura, um, mm-hmm. who they are this like weird sort of like stunted uh, f- uh, form of people. Like they are, um, they're sexless and they're ageless and they- God, I wish that were me. They're said to sort of resemble people with Down syndrome. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there are the weirdest and coolest things are the time tombs. Now the time tombs are these structures in this one specific valley in Hyperion that move backwards through time. <laughs> Thinking is all these people are kind of monitoring their 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 anti entropic fields, and they know two things: one, they were sent back from the future, and two, that they're about to open and they don't know what's going to happen. What <laughs> starts off with all of these people on what's called a tree ship because there's a society of people called the Templars who live on this planet uh, of trees and the trees are tree ships. Like the trees, they have their own oxygen fields. They float through space. They do their whole thing. There's a lot of solar punk later on in the series. It's incredible. I um, love that. So basically each book is told, uh, well, I should say the first two are told in different ways and the, uh, and the Endymion uh, books are told in like a combination of past tense and present tense, right? Mm-hmm. So the first book is just sci-fi Canterbury Tales, right? Ooh! Every one has a title. Also, yeah. the Canterbury Tales yes. are fucking stupid. They are. <laughs> and we deserve better in our public education system. <laughs> we deserve better than <laughs> the Canterbury Tales. If we at least got to learn them in middle or old English, it'd be cool. Oh my god, no, of course. I mean, we we sort of did in our in our class. Like our teacher was like, so this is what happened. I'm going to explain all the jokes to you. Even the ones about boobs. Yes, I'm going to explain the jokes to you. Could it be that Chaucer was a horny weirdo who just wanted to write some smut for people? And I just was like always reading <laughs> I was always like the one who understood old English because of mom. <laughs> now she's always yeah. For those <laughs> who don't know, our our mom has a master's in medieval history, so we were raised on like Beowulf, Latin, <laughs> friggin' Roman history, um, <laughs> Baroque guitar, yeah. in the um, yeah. like 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 I'm lute music, lute music. But like so yeah, so yeah, it was great because like. 
she had she had so much knowledge on such hyper specific things in medieval times. She uh, still has and still does because well because <laughs> when you pay that much money for a degree, you don't forget anything, right? No, you really don't. No, you don't. But like anyway, so she's the one who like inspired me to take Latin in high school. Now I'm taking it also in college. Actually, speaking of Latin, so another entity that plays a big role in this series, believe it or not, is actually the Catholic Church, right? So like it's this weird kind of space version of the Catholic Church in the Hyperion and Hyperion. It's going to tie nicely into our Shira conversation. In in Hyperion and the fall of Hyperion, they're this really tiny little world called Panet or called Pachem. Yeah, Pachem, which is Latin for peace. Um, and like they have. I these, think you mean Pachem then. Pachem, whatever. I I don't speak Latin, dude. Nobody I, speaks Latin, but I know how to pronounce it. <laughs> don't speak Latin in Latin. Nobody speaks Latin. People don't speak it. Oh my God, I actually saw, my friend sent this amazing meme the other day about like when you take Latin, learning a modern language. Where is the train station? I am well, thank you. Here is my pencil case. <laughs> learning Latin. Indeed, they desire glory. Have you expelled jealousy from your soul? We must sacrifice before we wage war. And my friend said that to me and I was like, that's not even a joke. That is, those are exact sentences that I had to translate last year. Well, because that's all that you have left is like, is like stuff that like Roman, uh, like middle, upper middle class people were sending. Literally sections of the Bible because the Bible was written in Latin. Literally one of the questions was like, and then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Like that was one of my fucking, but like, like. Oh, Marcus, I know. It ties into a lot of the themes of the of the Hyperion books, right? So you've got these, you got these. Uh, I believe, I forget how many there are. You've got the Consul, right? Uh, he is one of the few people in the universe who actually has a personal starship. He's also a pianist. He plays a lot of classical piano music, right? You've got the Templar Hetmastein, who is the captain of the ship, and he's kind of like their, uh, the, like he's with them. I I don't know specifically what he's trying to do. I forget. I think there's this artifact he's trying to open and he thinks that the time tombs are going to help him. There's this guy named the Pilgrim named Saul Weintraub, who's from, uh, they, I will say it engages in a thing that I don't like where every world is, it's one thing. Here's the Jewish world. Here is the, here is the uh, Annapolis, Maryland world. That's not how worlds work. He's from this, uh, the world called Hebron. And the thing is he's trying, he has this infant daughter with him named Rachel. Now, uh -huh. Rachel's, uh, every single story is a different um, genre. Rachel mm -hmm. is like, it's a, it, it's a sick kid story, right? Because mm -hmm. she was studying the time tombs in her mid-20s. And then she contracted this horrible uh, the disease where every day she forgets another day and she gets a day younger. So like, so like she wakes up when she's 26 years old and... Uh, but she's in the body, like, and, and like, and the brain of the person she was when she was 25 years old and 364 days, right? Mm -hmm. Like, she keeps getting younger every single day. And so he has to take her to the time tombs and reverse this aging thing before she vanishes into nothing and dies. And it's this really, like, soul-crushing, heart-wrenching story about this guy, like, trying whatever he can to like keep things normal and like he and his wife are like like because she's because as her brain goes back in time it starts reconstructing all the memories that she's lost and so she wonders so she'll wake up somewhere and she's like wait i thought i was having a sleepover or something and then you're like oh god no. and they're like oh we can't tell that our friends are actually in their 30s and that that was forever ago and then you've got um you've got my, one of my favorites is there's this detective who she the uh, she is from this like gas giant, so she's like a bit of like a shorter, stockier person, right? Mm -hmm. This the detective or Rachel? Um, no, 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 um, not 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 Rachel. Rachel's a girl. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's this detective, and so her story is this guy walks into her office. He goes, "I need you to investigate a murder," and then she goes, "Who's?" And he goes, "Mine." And he is what is called a cybrid. He is an organic human body with an AI consciousness that is stored where 
in this place called the Techno Core. Now the Techno Core. I wish that was me. Oh, dude. Okay. So the Techno Core, they're not. It's not just a name for some obscure hard industrial genre that Carrie's really into, right? It's the name of the collective consciousness of all of the artificial intelligences that operate all of the machines of the world web and the hegemon, right? Fun. So they operate the forecasters. I think they're responsible for a lot of the big computers and a lot of the big communications that go on and they have their own agendas too. Um, and so he doesn't know who killed him and he doesn't know why they killed him. And like she gets involved with like investigating this place called the cult of the Shrike because of course there's a cult for the Shrike. He's a big scary nebulous thing. Of course there's a thing around him, right? There's um, a cult for everything. The first one is really cool. There's a priest. Uh, he's one of the Catholic priests. Now mm -hmm. he's trying to find out what happened to this guy named Paul Dure, who went to go investigate the Bakura, right? And he is just reading entries from Paul Dure's journal. And it's, and that's the first chapter of Hyperion. It's like a hundred something pages long. And it's just excerpts from Paul Dure's journal. And as you're reading that, you realize, okay, something's up because there are these structures around that run underground multiple worlds called labyrinths, right? Mm -hmm. And the labyrinths, nobody knows how they were made, right? And the thing is, like, the Shrike introduces this parasite called the Cruciform, right? Now, the Cruciform, they, they, ask, they ask Paul Duray a lot, are you of the Cruciform? And he says, oh, yes, I, I'm a priest. And then, they, then one day, they see him with his shirt off, and they freak out, they strip him naked, and they realize he's not of the Cruciform. Now, the cruciform is this parasite that brings you back to life when you die, right? But the problem is, and this is why the Vakura are these sexless, ageless beings. Mm -hmm. It actually, um, you eventually, like, it, it stunts you physically after, yeah. right? And that's a big problem because mm -hmm. he doesn't want to know what happens, right? And so, uh, and so... Uh, and so the priest is trying to figure out what happened with him. And then there's a cool twist at the end. And it's, and it's one of those things that makes your, your skin crawl. It's awesome. <laughs> there's the, there's a general, there's this guy named Fedman Kassad. And he is trying to find, um, he met this, this woman in this virtual like soldier simulator, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and, and, and the simulation he was running was he was actually in Agincourt fighting the French cavalry. And then he meets this woman in the simulator and they fall in love and they have this thing. And like, he starts dreaming about her and all this stuff. And he's going to the time tubes to try to figure out who she is and what kind of message he's, she's trying to send to him. And like, that's this really cool, um, like it's this weird, like star crossed lovers, but also like, am I sane? What's actually going on type thing. Yeah. A lot of mystery to the story. And so the Hyperion is like a compilation of stories. It's not like, well, sort of. So it is one story. Like they, mm -hmm. they, you, they go from place to place. They, he describes the, um, like the towns and the hot jungles of Hyperion, all the different continents and stuff. And then travel. But it follows specific people at yeah. different points. Yeah. They'll, they'll decide who tells the next story or whatever. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Like the Canterbury Tales. I get that. Like, yeah, totally. Yeah. And like the Canterbury Tales, one of them doesn't get the chance to tell their story because stuff happens. And Ooh. There's a lot of cool twists and turns in this. And it's also, it would make this podcast last two hours, not one, right? Um, yeah. um, and then you get to, what I love about the, the series is, uh, like, if you read the titles, it tells you what happens, right? Hyperion, fall of Hyperion. Then then <laughs> rise of Endymion, right? So, like, ah. this society, and it's a very kind of Game of Thronesy type thing where you've got all these, like, forces. One of the most important forces, actually, are the ousters. Now, so mm -hmm. I've just been talking about people that change planets so they can live on them. But then there's the people called the ousters. They don't live on planets. They live in space. So they ended up evolving away from us. So they have these long, gangly, like, uh, fragile bodies, and they and they have their own, like, separate language and stuff. Like how in Wally, -E, after a while, the human bodies kind of have less, less bones, and they evolve for space Actually, and less gravity. But, but, but in the opposite direction. So there are these long, spindly things, and they speak a different language. And one of the cool, there's a lot of, like, body horror in these, uh, in these books, right? Um, and so, so in Fedman Kassad's story, because he's a soldier, 
And one thing I like about it is they break the different branches into there's there's all capitals force and then force space force air force uh, ground force uh, navy. Um, he I think he's in force space. And so you um, mean space force? Ah. Uh, Yo. Did you see that the Space Force TV show was able to get the trademark for the Space Force before the actual Space Force did? Well, that's well, that makes sense because unlike the actual Space Force, the show is real. So, makes sense. Well, what so, a fucking weird time we live in. You know, it's weird that this makes more sense. This makes so much more sense than the time we live in now. I want to go back. You no, know, so, so he. Fought- want to go back to before I knew anything. That was a good time. The Zemeckisad finds a ship full <laughs> of ouster prisoners, right? Yes. You know what ousters do to their prisoners? They vivisect them alive. What does that mean? So they, uh, so they, they open you up just to take a look at you. So like they cut off their limbs, they remove a lot of their sensory organs, but they keep them alive. So it's very, ugh. and then you, but then you actually meet more of them in the fall of period, and you realize there are these entire there are so many more different houses. You realize that the big philosophy was the problem with the hegemony was they were trying to change the universe to be theirs, but these other people, they change themselves. So they, if they're going to live on a gas giant, they change themselves to get these like big membrane wings so they can like, like float in the gas and all that. And there's, and there's all this talk about the big theme about it is it's about the future and it's about who gets to decide the future. Like, mm-hmm. like there are a lot of important people throughout history that are referred to and that they, that they run into throughout um, both in our both, both that actually existed and that are in the fictional uh, uh, back uh, old times of this world. And there are so many different questions like the techno core is divided on. So can, should we assimilate? Should we destroy them? Should we uh, should we abandon them and like do our own thing? Um, you've got the people from the future who like you you meet a few of them but this is we're talking people from like billions of years in the future right like there are so many things that have happened and um so it's a really cool story where like um there's also a bit of an environmentalist bent because you get to the last story of hyperion and it is by far the best one which doesn't surprise me because originally it was a standalone short story that Dan Simmons wrote. And I think it actually inspired the whole thing. Um, it's about this guy who lived on this world with this woman named Siri. And it's about like their relationship, but it's also about um, the dolphins of the world and how they were driven to extinction and how they were eradicated, how the world was corrupted by people's, um, uh, by this imperialist drive that the hegemony had. And, why this character now um, believes in the um, uh, in, in in the cause of fighting against the hegemony, right? And like, there's a lot of unrest. There's a lot of uh, and there's a lot of really cool um, societal changes that have happened. Actually, my favorite one is that they don't use Mister or Mrs. They just use the letter M. So like, Mina Gladstone is M Gladstone, right? Ah. Uh. Kassad is M Kassad, and. Uh. Um, they never say the console's name, but Saul Weintraub is just M. Weintraub. And, like, it's this really cool, like, elegant, simple way of doing things. And you get the feeling that because the head of the government is called the CEO, that they are they have this corporate efficiency to them, right? It's really cool. And then, of course, underpinning all of it, you've got um, the Shrike. And the Shrike is this really crazy, cool enigmatic figure. You never actually figure out what the heck its deal is by the end of the series. Aww. It's probably from the future. You think it might be an agent of the techno core, but you're not really sure. Um, and like he's described as having like four arms, but you, no one can ever like, no one can really tell how the joints work, right? He's like covered in spikes. So like, it, it's just, ah, uh, it's this trippy, he really is covered in spikes. He is. There's a lot of really cool, and then once you get to the Endymion books, this is after everything has happened in Hyperion. It's like 300 years in the future, right? And the way I like to break it up is so Hy- the Hyperion and the fall of Hyperion are breaking bad, right? If he had never written anything else in this series, it would have been amazing. It would have been a landmark sci-fi duo, and everyone would love it. But Endymion is like El Camino, right? 
because which I haven't seen yet. Okay, so I won't say anything about El Camino. Don't worry. Thank you. It was not a complete series before they made El Camino, right? El Camino yeah. finishes the series. Like I didn't think they would need to, but they do. And yeah, and is okay. So, it, and it and it kind of brings up a thing that I think is missing in a lot of conversations about uh, that even happen in the real world about what society should we live in uh, and all this stuff. There was a lot of focus placed on what should be removed, what should be gotten rid of. And after Hyperion falls, right, this book is about what society do we build after that, right? Because there is a society that takes over after everything has happened. They're called the Pax, and they're this like really harsh, strict um, Catholic government, right? Like they've banned a lot of technology. Um, they only have uh, like sublight travel. And one thing that's really cool is because they found a way to, uh, to, to fix the cruciform so that it doesn't stunt you, they have these cool ships that go, they're called Archangel class ships. They go so fast that you get reduced to mush and then you get resurrected. Yay! Like, it's this crazy thing. And like he, uh, one of the characters gets resurrected. He described it as like, it's like being born again. Like literally like everything is new again. And if you hear that, that that's Jess coming back from work. Yay! <laughs> um, but there's this girl who's the child of one of the characters from the Hyperion books named Aenea. A-E-N-E-A. -E -E Her name being a palindrome is intentional because she's actually from the past and she's meant to inspire the future. Um, and you follow this, this guy from Hyperion named Roland Dinian and it's just their story and, it, it, and it's his story is both her initially her caretaker and then through time violation she eventually her lover and like the society that they build and the weird cool stuff and so it's just this planet trek thing and you shoot back and forth between his perspective and their yes yes i have a question are there any people of color or black people in the stories well, there are dude yeah totally there's um are there any are they are, are any of the main characters so Fedman Kassad is implied to be either, um, like, I think he's either Middle Eastern or he's Indian, uh, just based mm -hmm. on the name. Uh, I know that, oh, I forgot her name. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the word, the, the detective. I think she's, she's described as having darker skin. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, in the second book, uh, in, in the second, uh, in, uh, in, in Endymion, there's a there's a lot of societies that are more uh, people of color oriented. I will say though, it, because it was a written, it's written by a white guy, and it was written in like the I think the late '80s, early '90s. So there aren't a lot of people of color. Mm -hmm. I don't think there are really like, I really don't think there's a lot of LGBT people in um in the thing. Uh, but like, it, it, nonetheless, it is still a very progressive otherwise a very progressive uh, book mm -hmm. um it's a really yes yes you um have, yes i have another question um yeah. well not a question but a statement i remembered something that's actually really important from the mysterious Benedict society i totally forgot to say let, let, let's come back to you let drop the curtain okay. is nicholas benedict's long lost twin brother Ooh, okay and so he has narcolepsy i see he has narcolepsy Oh, okay. But he's the bad guy. So they're able to use it to their advantage. Yeah. And like, um, um, there's, when the kids see him for the first time, because they're supposed to go undercover to the Institute, and they're supposed to be like, you know, trying to f fool his, his, I don't know, mayhem, right? Trying to prevent him from becoming the master. Like, he is, they see Le Drop the Curtain, but he looks just like Mr. Benedict. And they're like, oh my God, were we set up? What the fuck? And so they have to wait. Guys, how you doing? They have to wait until like that night when um, when they're, when like Rhonda and number two can communicate with them. And they're like, they send them a message from the shore, from the mainland. And they're like, oh uh, yeah, um, we didn't know that he looked like that, sorry. He is apparently his long lost twin. Fuck! We didn't look that far into it. Oh my god! I'm a, like a picosecond of research. Holy shit! <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of the 
Oh, okay. Do you remember um, the that one guy from the Catch Predator where like he shows up and they don't know whose chat log he has? They're like, "Are you serious? Yeah. You just uh, what? Hi, hi. Hi, Jess. Okay. Happy birthday. So that she says hi. She says, "Viewers, my wife says that she says hi to you too." Uh, not too much longer. By the way, I bought RoboCop. He's amazing. So. Sure. Yeah. Oh, by the way, unrelated to anything. So Mortal Kombat 11 released three new characters. One of them is RoboCop. I was really hoping you were going to say one of them is trans, and then I got RoboCop, and I felt like I got slapped in the face. I'll say, uh, I, I don't know her canonical uh, oh, rally, but I think that Jax, the guy with robotic arms, I think his daughter is gay. Because one of her costumes is is uh, is Breed's Pride, and it's like a leather jacket with like rainbow stripes on the front. She's actually a really fun character to play. She's awesome. I love that. But, but um, so yeah, like the uh, my favorite. I, I will say I don't want to give too much away from it, mainly because it's really dense. There's there's a lot of talk about philosophy yeah. And, uh, and the like, only book that I've ever read that you suggested to me that was sci-fi like Hyperion was Ringworld. Yeah. And it took me two months to read it. And I was reading it like constantly. Ringworld, okay, it's a really, it's a much denser book than, uh, than that, right? I read it in six days. What the fuck is wrong with you? It was, it was that good. I couldn't stop. It's very good, but it, I still remember like all the details. Like some of the sentences are just so detailed that you just do not forget them. Ringworld in, in, uh, in less time than Hyperion, because Ringworld is actually much, it's a much more straightforward. It's like, hey, how does this place work? Ringworld oh. is not straightforward. What are you saying? The circle, because it's Ringworld. That's right. It's not, no. Okay. Ringworld is, no. But that's right. I remember, like, I still have the images from Hyperion. There's one page in the fall of Hyperion, which is it. There's a, so I don't, I don't want to say how it happens. There's no pictures. In the fall of Hyperion, right? Um, and it has ramifications for the rest of the series. And he spends two pages telling you what happens on each world as a response to it. And it's like the most haunting, devastating, intriguing thing that I've, that I've read in any book ever. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, I, I'll tell you, there's this one segment, there's a, there's a world that they go to in, in Dimian. They're on this raft. Because there were there were a lot of structures that were built using far casters, right? Um, there were like like houses, right? A lot of the wealthiest people had multi-world houses, right? So one world would be floating in an ocean world, would floating in an ocean world, and like one one room would be up at the tallest skyscraper on like Earth or some other place, right? Um, well, there were these two rivers that ran all throughout the worlds, right? And I think it's the Thames is the one that they're writing on. Um, and one of the worlds when, uh, when the hegemony fell was this ice world that they terraformed to not be icy anymore. And when, it, and when the terraforming failed, everything froze over. The water froze over, the atmosphere froze over, everything froze over. So there's like two species that live there now. There are these, there's this, uh, this tribal group of people and he actually invents a naming scheme and a language for them, which Roland Nibian describes as it sounds like gravel because he only has like, the only constants they have are K, C, H, and T. So like one of them is named Kuchiat and the other one is named Chichakut. And so like, it, it, there is just this- That's cute as it's, hell. But there's only, but the other species are, the, are these things called the ice rates. And there are these crazy like vacuum proof giant monsters that burrow through um, the uh, the icy world at the speed of like, they estimate it's like 30 kilometers per hour, right? And there's a point where they realize that like, they've only ever been fighting the pups, like the really big ones can, that can clear out massive tunnels, right? I hate it when that happens. They would never even come close to them, right? Um, and they, and all their gear is actually made out of ice wraith body parts. So like all their clothing is ice wraith. There's a part where they actually climb into space uh, to the top of the frozen um, atmosphere. And they put on like, 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 um, like, like, like the skins of ice wraith uh, faces 
right? Yeah. All is reflecting on how, like, they're, if they were wearing spacesuits, their visors would have been scratched by now. But their eye, uh, but their compound eye lenses aren't chipping at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and then they get to. I think the last part of the story is they find an ice wraith den, right? And it's completely full of human body parts. And they realize that they have been like they have been in a symbiotic relationship the whole time. Like the way that the people think of the ice wraiths, the ice wraiths think of the people. Mm -hmm. and, and it's this really cool way. It is easily my favorite and the most memorable part of any point in the series for me, I think, aside from the very end, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, so I will say, like, if you like big, sprawling, cool stories that deal with big themes and are, like, really oddly whimsical in how, like, because I will say, this guy can end a book so fucking well. Like, the, like I have not read an ending of any of these books that didn't maybe just like, like didn't feel me with emotions. Like mm -hmm. so effective, right? Um, he knows just the right way to set up an action scene. He knows just the right way to set up humor and to add levity and to add horror. Because again, he wrote a book that was adapted into a horror series on AMC, right? Mm -hmm. So good shit. And I feel like given that I love Umbrella Academy and that I'm really enjoying the current run of X-Men, I probably fall in love with the series Benedict Society so much. Honestly, it's really cool. I actually, <clears throat> I was looking at the front of this book and I real I remembered this character. Okay. And this whole subset of characters. His name is McCracken. McCracken? What? Mick, no, McCracken. McCracken. Mick McCracken. So like. Okay. Actually, what Mr. Rel Academy is called the Kraken. That's awesome. Mr. Curtin hires this group of like business looking looking businessmen to basically be his henchmen. I I they have briefcases full of torture devices. The calculators, when you throw them, or business cards, I think. The business cards when you throw them. The calculators are bombs. So you put in the seconds that you, the minutes or whatever, and then they take the business cards and you throw them and they can cut things like sharp as fuck. They have pencils that like they throw with accuracy like blades. Um, they call them 10 men because they have 10 different ways to hurt you. Okay. Oh, all right. Pretty sure that they have watches. They have watches on each wrist. With, they have like this signature thing where they go like this, they shake their they shake their, their um, sleeves away from their arms and they hold out their wrists and they tase you with their fucking, it's awful. Oh, and there's this guy named Milligan who turns out to be Kate's long lost dad. And the reason that um, Milligan is like the, like the henchman of Mr. Benedict. He's, well not the henchman, but you know, he's like the helper. He's a, an amazing spy and he has absolutely no memory because he was kidnapped by Mr. Curtin and his his memory was wiped clean and so he escapes and somehow manages to find mr benedict and finds out that mr benedict is working against mr curtain so he's like sure i'll i'll devote my spy services to you and then kate comes along having been an orphan her whole life and running off to the circus and leaving all the orphanages and then finding this ad in the newspaper and takes the tests and then joins mr benedict and <clears throat> all of a sudden she and Milligan are together. Nobody knows that they're related until like the end of the first book or something. They're, because I, yeah. he he's trying to save the kids at one point and something he's doing completely sparks his memory and brings him back. And he's like, because oh! they share the same memory of the word mill again. Because she, okay. when she was like three years old, she said, daddy, can we go to the mill again? And he was the dad. And so he goes by Milligan because Mill again was the last words that were ringing in his ears when he woke up from having his brain washed. And then, so it's crazy, right? There's this moment when Milligan, he's like, he's about to get taste and he grabs the fucking little wires out of the air. Anyways, I just wanted to throw that in there. Uh, oh. Milligan is fucking great right. and so amazing. You I love him. I can't believe I forgot about this. So. <laughs> So somebody, if, if, if there's any commenters out there, you probably screamed at me, you probably screamed at me and I mentioned Earth because Earth was destroyed, like, initially, right? That's why people- Exists in the series? Uh, so Earth was destroyed, right? Um, 
in what was called, uh, ah, so close. What was called the big mistake, right? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> experimenting with, <laughs> yeah, oh, it's that kind of series, man. So this is, I, name. I have to look his name up. He is the coolest. <laughs> Um, there could have not been a possible a better, better name. In oh my god. Hyperion. Um, wow, that's magical. Hyperion that changed my life. Hang on, so there's, oh, I forgot. So remember how I said that people were called M? Well, there is a, one exception. Androids are referred to as A, and Ooh. androids are all blue. So basically, they're all Tobias from Arrested Development. It's awesome. Or Dr. Manhattan from the Dr. Manhattan series. See, these are the only blue lives that really matter. That That's very true, yes. And he's not even blue all the time, so actually that makes more sense, yeah, totally. Um, Wait, Dr. Manhattan? Well, uh, well, it, yeah, because in the- Do you remember the moment when they're like, we're gonna put makeup on you because you need to be a little darker for the camera. And he's like, oh, you mean like this? Snap, and he's a little darker. They're like, ah! <laughs> actually, wait a minute, that, that yeah, totally. So that was really funny. characters, uh, oh, okay. So one of the characters is a poet, right? His name is Martin Selenus, right? Now Martin Selenus is a poet from Earth, so he's really, really old. There's this, there's this, uh, there's this uh, blue thing called Polson. Uh, it's a little bit like Agent Coulson from uh, Agents of Shield, but uh, but more impervious, right? Mm -hmm. um, where it's the magical science bullshit they get to have a guy who's like five, six hundred years old, right? So mm -hmm. he was born to the super family on old earth, as they call it, right? During the, the old earth. The old earth. Well, there's a new place called New Earth, which I think is the seat of government power, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, and he, so he was born on old earth when the cataclysms were happening, right? Um, there are these big earthquakes, there are these tremors, because what happened when the great mistake was they were experimenting with primitive AI to build singularities to build farcaster portals, and they accidentally shot one into the core of the earth. So the earth was slowly getting sucked into itself and the poor people all died and the rich people got to leave, right? That sounds which, accurate and so, very sad. So which is, which is great, awesome. Which is the inverse of what happens in, where is it, where is it, is it, here we go. In Infest the Rat's Nest, in Infest the Rat's Nest, the King Gizzard environmentalist thrash album, which you should listen to, it was great. Um, Are they at all related to King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard? That's them. I just called them King Gizzard. Oh, love that. Okay, their album before that was like a blues boogie kind of like rag, the kind of like I know, kind of like Gypsy Jazz album. It's really good. Well, because I I gave it to you guys for Christmas. It's really good. Mm -hmm. This is the album they released five months later. It's like apocalyptic environmentalist thrash album. They're the best band ever. Shut up. That's what we deserve. So for the record, the um. So what he does is he and he has this crazy life where like. He ends up showing, he ends up going uh, onto this, they're called spin ships. They spin up to sublight speed and they go out into the cosmos. Well, a couple things happen. First, he loses all of his money from his inheritance. And he also loses all of his higher brain functions except the ability to, the, the ability to swear. So he, so, oh, it's wonderful. Martin Salinas is like my favorite character. He, he's also in Endymion. So he ends up being like a thousand years old at the end of the series, right? So he, so like he refers to people as like shit and poo poo, um, uh, when, before he gets his language back, and he kind of works his way up, and he he gains a lot of fame because he writes this book, this the epic poem called The Dying Earth, right? Which is actually a reference to another sci-fi novel by Jack Vance called The Dying Earth, which I have. I love it when that shit happens. That's it, so delicious. It's so cool. Dan Simmons blurs the lines between like shit that's actually happening and like references and like and and made up stuff and it's it, he doesn't give a shit he's like i'm gonna put it in the book damn it uh whatever I'm, not gonna play in a book. Uh, I'm gonna have there be like like zen buddhist temples in a in a in, a, in the sky i'm gonna make an avatar avatar yeah totally except cooler because avatar didn't take place on an alien planet in the future <gasps> what if it does how dare you what how dare you call anything cooler than avatar that was mean well i i apologize to avatar i apologize to everybody involved in that was show. so mean I 
I apologize to Dante Bosco, the voice of Zuko, because that dude's cool. Dante Bosco was in But I'm a Cheerleader. He he's also he was he was in the movie where a gay kid comes to acceptance with herself, and he's one of the gay kids. That's he gets kicked out of the anti-gay conversion camp because he's making out with this other guy. This and then a longer career than I expected. Oh my god! And then no, this was like during Avatar years. This was a long time ago. And then at the end of the movie, he like lures his lover away from the anti-gay camp. And then they make out run away into the sunset with the other two girls who make out run away into the sunset. Beautiful. I love it. It's a really good movie. It's really I will funny. run away with you, Rufio. We will form the Lost Boys on Neverland. I'm pretty sure that the the other guy's name is like Clyde or Colton or something. I, Colton sounds more appropriate in my mind. Yeah. Clyde, nobody would name anyone Clyde. Can you imagine anybody being named Clyde that's awful? Like if you are named Yeah, Clyde, I must suck. We should start a GoFundMe called People Who Are Named Clyde. No other explanation. We just like we pay for the Clyde. therapy, but we don't tell anybody that. Thousand dollars as as apologizing. No, but so so he lives this crazy life for like he <clears throat> epic poem. Wait, who's he? You should write these shitty like dime novel sequels. So he does, and then eventually he sells everything and he gets this like he gets this surgery to look more like a satyr. And he joins this this camp of artists. Like a satyr? You mean like a satyr? A like satyr, with... yes, a satyr. So like uh, Pan. So yeah, Pan. To work on his masterpiece, right? And so he goes and they found this city in Hyperion and everything goes bad, but over time, because the Shrike exists. And mm -hmm. the Shrike is taking people over and over again. And there's this king, I think he's called the Sad King. I forget what his, what, his, uh, what his name is. That's me. I'm the sad king. You're the sad king. I'm the sad king. All people are gender non-specific kings. We are all gender neutral kings. Right? We are, we are just the, the vibe of kings. It's just we stand a monarch. We stand a monarch. We stand a butterfly. We stand, to, to stand a butterfly. The sequel to the butterfly. Which, ah, oh, dude, I want more of that album. Crazy. So, um, and so, like, the guy's like, so what's going on? What the hell is the Shrike thing? And then he just kind of goes, well, the Shrike is my muse. And then he just walks off because that's what happens. There's wow, so what a dumb bitch. Fans, and he's such a douche, but, like, such an – okay, my favorite kind of character is an arrogant douche who is on the side of good and knows what they're talking about, right? Like, when we, when we get to – I hate those guys. I like, like guys that are, like, chaotic neutral – like truly chaotic neutral, they're so my favorite. I, I, you could argue that the Shrike is chaotic neutral because, like, it is. Yes. So it doesn't even have. <gasps> it exists. It's really That's my D and D character, by the way, is chaotic neutral. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I, I made a when when I played D and D for literally thirty minutes seven years ago. Um, <laughs> I made this chaotic, uh, this neutral evil character. Mm. Like, neutral and evil because of his obsession with revenge because mm -hmm. he was betrayed a long time ago um i gave him a cool name i called him avadin mm. you know it's one of those names you come up with and you're like gotta put that in my back pocket he, that as many times i can my guy's name is ferroris because it's latin for rage and he's a barbarian so he goes oh. into blind rages I... and he's a dragonborn he's the dragonborn that breathes poison oh and that's that's cool, um, dude. Leo, Leo drew um, a picture of him, and he, since he's green, everybody was like, ooh, it's orc time. And I'm like, no, he's a dragon. This is racist. It was very funny. Everybody was like, oh, God, I'm racist in fantasy. I'm like, yeah, you are. <laughs> There's, really funny. I forget, are there dragons? In a, I think the only thing up here and doesn't have are dragons. Aww. It's got. It's, well, it's got, definitely not better than Avatar, then. Blue people. Okay, that's true. It's, Avatar has dragons. Avatar is great. One of these days we're gonna have, have. We should have just like an Avatar appreciation podcast. I'm gonna literally write my thesis on Avatar. You should write. You should write more Avatar. We should write more Avatar. We should. We should fix Legend of Korra and make it not quite the best that it was. But Legend of Korra still like. I've been listening to and reading all this discourse about Avatar and stuff, and it's like Legend of Korra might not have been great, and it might not have been perfect the way that Avatar The Last Airbender was, and it might not even compare, 
But don't say that it drags down Avatar The Last Airbender. There are still good things. Here's the thing about Legend of Korra, right? Legend of Korra is called Avatar The Legend of Korra. It's not called Avatar The Last Airbender The Next Generation. Mm -hmm. So Korra is a different character who lives in a different time and yeah. different problems, right? Her problems aren't really so much of, um, like, it, it's not like World War II with, with mages, right? Like, she's going through the problems of this sudden radical industrialization of this society. And then there's this guy wearing a mask that was evil or something. They did a bad job making that bad guy. Honestly. He looks really cool, though. You gotta admit. Well, like, yeah, he looks really cool, but, I mean, he looks, like, identical to the bad guy in Big Hero 6. Like, if you... If you can... If you manage to make a bad guy that, like... But it didn't, that's also one of the reasons why Ozai was such a good bad guy, is because he wasn't masked. He has a face. That he's actually, like, attractive, Absolutely. and that's scary. The real reason he's such a good bad guy is because he's voiced by Mark Hamill, right? And if God. you want any bad guy to sound so good. You know, wreck your shit, you let Mark Hamill voice him. And you know what? Actually, something really cool. Um, Shira, the bad guy, is um, he's voiced by. Uh, have you seen The Good Place? Oh, okay. Don't say anything. We are three episodes away from the end. Oh wait, you mean the end of all of it, or the end of the first season, or all of it? Oh, okay. Well, no, no, it's not. Don't worry about it. You know the guy who's friends with Chidi. And he's like, Chidi. Oh, really? Yeah, him. That's the that's the bad guy um, in, in She-Ra. We're, well, we're bad guy. a good place at some point, too. That's I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Because I looked I looked him up on IMDb, and it said that he was in the good place, and he was Chidi's friend. And I was like, okay, cool, 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 cool. <laughs> to, to, to quote Abed from Community, cool. Cool, 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 the first three and a half seasons, utter perfection. Utter perfection, yes. We need to end this episode talking about the shades of yellow. The shades of yellow. You think that there are too many and I think that there are not enough. Debate begins okay. now. Okay. I'm so right. There, I win. I would like to argue though, right? Now, here is my thing. I'm approaching this not necessarily from just a philosophical perspective, but also from a capitalist perspective, right? Disgusting, continue. It is disgusting, trust me, okay? I get paint on all my clothes, it's awful. Oh, that's right, okay, well, Des works at Lowe's at the paint counter, so Working. continue. So here's my thing, right? <laughs> my main beef with all the different colors of yellow is that you don't need that many for your house. You yeah, your house is separate from this. Okay, but no, here's the thing, right? You need like a darkish yellow, you need like a brightish yellow, you need like a muted yellow, you need like a, a, like a pastel -y yellow, right? You need a kind of combination green yellow and a kind of combination orange yellow, and that's it. Okay, so there's a question that was posed to this, I'm gonna call him a failed congressional candidate because that's what he is, um, uh, Joshua Collins. Mm -hmm. um, and he, they asked him, well, what is the furthest left policy that you would propose if you were in office? And he goes, um, confiscating businesses that violate trade practices. And everybody was like, that's already a thing. And so I was like, and so I've been blowing that over. Here's what I would do, right? If I was put in charge of everything, you know what I would do? I'd get rid of choice. No choices, no choices. You want a laptop? This is the laptop. We put all the best stuff in this laptop. It's the laptop that you buy. You buy this laptop. Do you want the best TV? We got different sizes, but it's the same TV, different sizes. That's it. This is, this is the paint that you buy. This is the kind of brush you buy. Imagine how much money we'd all save on a society. Is that yeah. left or right, man? Right? No, totally. Uh, right? Like, leave, leave. No, leave. I'm saying, is that left or is that right? I think it's just pragmatic, damn it. Damn it, damn it. I can't, no, I disagree. I, I disagree with you, choice. I have choice. You know why? Because first of all, okay. um, if there were only one type of, say, phone or one type of computer, what about the people who don't want a camera or the people who want more storage or the people who want a better camera because all they do is shoot video? Um, like, for me, 
I just got myself an iPad because I'm doing graphic design. Um, okay, the graphic design. Yeah. Uh, um, anyway, so I was like, I don't want a fucking iPad that's got like a fucking crazy camera because I'm not gonna be taking pictures. I want one that's got a lot of space. Yes, but hear me out. Hear me out. You know what else would be with the cost of which would probably be driven down by by a lack of choice? Cameras, actual cameras. And then you could get an external but hard it's drive so, to your but shit. There, but it's, it's too much. Okay. Fine. You need one thing. Fine. It's fine. Um, also, um, I think all of the colors of yellow are beautiful. And I think everybody should be allowed to choose what colors that they want. Because some colors go with some things and some don't. And all the colors are pretty, and everybody deserves to be able to find the right shade for them, and I think that they deserve that, and thank you. Well, because you won the debate and I don't want to let you have the last word, I will do something a little bit unorthodox. He agreed! I won the debate! I will read you. Hang on. There's no spoilers in this. <laughs> Sorry. I'm very okay. tired. I am going to read you one of my favorite ending lines in all of, uh, where is? All of Hyperion? All of I wanna find you, I wanna find you a line now. Actually, hold up, can, can you can you grab the fall of Hyperion? I think it's in my room. No. Okay, fine. <laughs> I can't, I can't. I where the fuck it is. Yeah. I've, moved, I've moved everything around in there. Hyperion and Cantos. Oops. Uh, can I ah man you've you've won so thoroughly that I literally can't find the line that I want to end it on also these books have illustrations at the tops of the chapters and I think that that's wonderful but oh. starting in the second book uh, Trenton Lee Stewart utilizes the illustrator who is named Diana Sudyuka, and I fucking love her. Look at the illustrations that she has. They're yeah. beautiful. They're like watercolor, but black and white, and I love yeah. them. They, they remind me a little Part bit. Part three, <laughs> home and not home. I love it. I love it. Look at the extraordinary education of Nicholas Benedict. Speaking of which, this one is basically just about him, like, um... Nicholas Benedict is an orphan, so he goes to an orphanage, um, having been separated from his twin brother at birth or something. So he goes to this orphanage, and he's like, wow, this is really inefficient. Let me see if I can help. And all these bullies are there, and they call, all the kids call them the spiders or whatever. And every time he, like, manages to, like, outsmart the bullies and make sure that everything runs more efficient. And there's, like, this rumor of hidden treasure, and he finds it. And at the very end, it's like, oh, the treasure was the library the whole time? I thought it was like money or a telescope or something. Maybe like, the treasure was we made along the way. Yeah. And it actually was. Like, he makes friends with this awesome guy named John and this girl named Violet who is deaf. And so she's, like, signing the whole time. And Nicholas either knows or doesn't know sign language. But no, he knows sign language. And then he, like, he and... Violet are teaching John sign language and they just get like really efficient at it. But he's like eight years old and he's smarter than every adult he's ever met. And he's so smart that he registers that he needs to keep his intelligence hidden or people will like think he's a smart ass and send him to another fucking orphanage. So it just occurred to me when he said that, like, so I'm, so I'm working on a story of my own. Uh, I'm currently in the obsessive <laughs> thinking about it phase and I'm probably going to stop that and actually write it at some point. Uh, it just occurred to me. Deaf people probably don't learn sign language in this world. They learn telepathy. Because like they in what all, world? Uh, in the world that I'm writing about. Oh, uh, I was like Hyperion, the Mysterious Benedict Society, our current existing world? Well, they probably could because people get like these cybernetic implants. Okay, whatever. So anyway, that has been our conversation about <laughs> Hyperion and the Benedict Society. And I'm I won the debate about the color yellow.
you, you, we won the debate about the color yellow. But then again, you're more of an artist than I am when it comes to visual media. So yeah, I, bitch, don't debate. You're literally in a room that is yellow, and you're arguing yeah, with me no. about the color yellow. 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 Okay. God, so I love that movie. Thank you all again. The next <clears throat> Gonzalez. Uh, next Gonzalez. Same Gonzalez time. Same Gonzalez place. Right here in both of our rooms, and also your room if you're watching this. Uh, well, we will be discussing the uh, the Netflix Shira show and the current one of today. Current, the current one, yes, and the Netflix Castlevania anime. Have a good one, everybody, and peace. This has been an episode of siblings talking to each other because they are siblings. D and D. D and D. D. Listen to my world. It's a great song. <laughs> Stop recording. And we are.